Hello, everybody. Once again, I thank you for joining us on our Mount Sinai NBC of Memphis YouTube channel. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, we once again come to study your word, asking as always that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive your fresh. In Jesus' name, amen. So we continue with article number 13, a gospel church. And our author writes, we believe that a visible church of Christ is a congregation of baptized believers associated by a covenant in the faith and fellowship of the gospel, observing the ordinances of Christ, governed by his laws, and exercising the gifts, rights, and privileges invested in them by his word, that its only scriptural officers are bishops, pastors, deacons, and whose qualifications, claims, and duties are defined in the epistles to Timothy and Titus. And our scripture continues to be in total, uh, 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, 1 through 13. But today, we have made our way down to verse 13. Uh, I'm sorry, verse 10. So we will be reading verse 10 through 13 from the New King James Version. And it reads, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no division among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you by br my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? So Paul came into the city of Corinth feeling um, pretty beat down because in the four cities prior to coming to Corinth, he had faced lots of oppositions. In Philippi, things started out with promise. Then the Judaizers came and caused confusion. The Judaizers were converted Jews that were falsely teaching that salvation required grace as well as works. They told the Gentiles that in order to receive salvation, they must first convert to Judaism by being circumcised and obeying the Mosaic law. So they caused trouble for Paul in Philippi. And then Paul left Philippi and went to Thessalonica and Berea. And then Paul came to Athens and a great intellectual center. Uh, it was a city full of philosophers with great minds. And they were skilled in worldly wisdom and philosophers. And uh, they had a philosopher's view. So in Thessalonica and Berea uh, and Philippi, they, Paul was faced with the Judaizers. And then when he came into Athens, uh, he had to deal with a lot of philosophical mindsets. And, and so, and Paul in Athens attempted to meet them on their ground. He, he tried to speak to them in the wisdom of the world on their terms and quoting from their authority. He, he didn't reach many people for Christ and probably left there feeling defeated. And so from there, he went to Corinth. And, and somewhere between Athens and Corinth, Paul decided that from then on, he would preach Jesus Christ only in the simplest of words. He, he would never again wrap the story of Jesus in the words of human wisdom and flowery speech. He, he would keep it simple and not try to impress folk with his words. In our day and time, that would be translated into him not hoping and, and putting on a performance and and 
you know, all the hoopla stuff that, that happens on Sunday morning. So when Paul founded the church at Corinth, his purpose was to exalt Christ and not himself or any other human. Paul wanted his converts to trust the Lord and not the servants. So he deliberately played down his own authority and ability. Paul's authority as a, an apostle came from Jesus Christ and God the Father. In Galatians 1 and 1, it says, From Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor by human agency, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. So even though Paul felt he had the authority to command, most often he chose not to use his authority. In dealing with the church at Thessalonica, he wrote, Although we could have imposed our weight as apostles of Christ, instead we became little children among you, like a nursing mother caring for her own children. With such affection for you, we were happy to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our lives, because you had become dear to us. Then we see the same type of appeal in Philemon 8 and 9. In verse 8 it says, So in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what is right, but because I love you, I am pleading with you instead. I, Paul, an old man now, and also a prisoner for Jesus, for Christ Jesus. My point is that this, my, my point is this, that even though Paul had the God-given authority to make demands, he chose not to. He wanted to know, he wanted them to know that he did have the right to do so, yet refrained from doing it because it was in the best interest of the kingdom of God. To me, that says a lot about the character of Paul and his love for Christ. He wanted folk to do right because it was right, it was the right thing to do to do, not because they were made to do so. As parents or as employers or as pastors or and just in general, wouldn't we all rather folk would do right because it's just right to do right? rather than having to be made to do so. The thing about having to make somebody do right is you don't know to what length you have to go. Take kids, for example. Some, you can just give them a, a, the evil eye, and that's enough to deter them. But as any parents with more than one child know, that if you are blessed to have one like that, there's always one that will test you. If you've got more than one, and one is one that you can just look at and, and, and they'll act right, that other one is always going to test you. Here, here's what I mean. I have two boys. When they were in school and required me to wake them up, one child, I could just walk by the room and, and very calmly call their name and say, time to get up. That was it. He would sit up and stretch and within a minute or less show an excitement about getting started with the day. That was it. Then I would brace myself for the second child. For him, I had to actually go into his room, say his name sternly, as I shook him, saying, get up. And, and then once I got a growl and somewhat of an acknowledgement that he heard me, I would walk out. Then in about five minutes or so, because I didn't hear any movement in the room, I would have to go back. This time, with bass, I would once again call his name, shake him with purpose, 
and make to mild threats. Then leave his room. After a few minutes, with no movement, I would go back a third time. This time, I would do all the above, but I also would pull all the covers off and, and, and kind of land them in a pile, you know, because I'm like jerking them off and, and the covers are now a pile in a heap in, on the floor. And I would stand there in attack mode and demand that he get up now, as in right now. My point is that whenever you decide to use your authority, you've got to be willing to take it as far as, as necessary to accomplish the desired effect. Otherwise, your authority becomes null and void. Paul didn't want to be known as the enforcer. You might get what you want initially, but not for the long term. Paul wanted the church to love Christ and out of, out of the love for Christ, do the right thing. The church at Corinth had lots of problems, but the main problem was division, which is what Paul dealt with first. Verse 11 says, For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. That word contentions shows the severity of the problem. The, the, the word means severe, quarreling, quarreling, strife, disputes, conflicts. It, it just means just like just really heated. The disputes were so heated that there was a danger of the church splitting. They had formed several cliques and were putting ministers up against each other. Some were following Paul, some were following Apollos, some were following Cephas uh, or, or Peter. And then there were others who took on the spiritual side and declared, we're not following any man, we're following Christ. Now clearly, the problem was not doctrine. Because Paul, Apollos, and Peter preached the same message of Christ. The problem then, as it is today, was in preaching ability and in the preaching style. We will size up a preacher by how he looks or his charisma uh, long before ever hearing the preach word. If he is well dressed and good looking and jovial and, and a performer, uh, as long as he says something close to sounding biblical, he will win over the majority of the crowd. According to Acts 18 and 24, Apollos was an eloquent man and mighty in scripture. Paul, on the other hand, according to 2 Corinthians 10 and 10 and uh, 11 and 6, he said, it says that Paul was not a great speaker. 2 Corinthians 10 and 10, the NIV says, For some say his letters are, my, are weighty and forceful, but in person he is unimpressive and his speaking amounts to nothing. And then 2 Corinthians 11, verse 6, NIV, it says, I may not be train, a trained speaker, but I do have knowledge. We have made this perfectly clear to you in every way. So even though we in our day and time think very highly of Paul, even songs are written with the words to be able to preach like Paul. But in Paul's days, some would beg the difference. Paul was preaching in Troas one Sunday uh, before leaving. he was going to leave the next day. And they fellowshiped, which included eating, then Paul started to preach. He preached into midnight, into, and a young man was sitting in the window, fell into a deep sleep, and fell out of the third story window to his death. Now, for the average church service, that would have been enough excitement and disturbance to end the service, but not so. Paul went down, threw himself on the man, he came back alive, 
Then Paul went back upstairs. They kind of did some more fellowship. They ate. And Paul went back to preaching and preached to daybreak. Even though Paul was not an eloquent speaker, he was gifted in, understand, in the understanding of the scripture and he was gifted as an administrator in, the, in church order. It is said that Paul was a, a small framed man. In, in my mind, I see him as a Columbo type. And for those who say, who is Columbo? Google it. But because Paul wasn't eloquent and, and, and had more of an in-your-face style, people undervalued him as a preacher. Unfortunately, that still holds true in our churches today. For those who have little or no interest in the Word of God, they need a show. So after the choir, if, if there's no show, then they go to sleep. For those who love the Word, who study the Word with purpose and are hungry for it, they can pretty much listen to a doorknob if it's speaking God's truth and speaking to a spiritual need. It can be compared to physical food. If you're hungry enough, you can eat what is served, whatever it is, eat it without complaining. But if you've been snacking all day on junk, you won't have much of an appetite for real food. But God's grace is so amazing. He can throw in some real food into your junk food reality that will completely change your life. God is just, he's just like that. Well, come back next time as we continue to take an inside look at the church in Corinth. And until then, take care, be blessed, and see you next time. Bye-bye.